All right, everybody, welcome again to the philosophy of art and science. But this is going to be another one of the double whammy episodes where I'm also going to post it with the Tawahado Bible study because scripture will be the emphasis of this episode as we get to know Father Dustin Lyon. And and tell me, am I pronouncing that right? Is it Lyon? Is it like yeah, Lyon? Just, yeah, here here in America, we just say Lyon. Lyon, you know, okay. When I, when I graduate from seminary, the, the dean of the seminary, um, Father John Bear was English, and so he put his English accent on it. When I graduated, it was it was Father Dustin Leon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. I thought no, it might no, be. No, uh, we we just say lion. Yeah, lion. Okay, yeah, that's that's kind of easier for most people. The anglicized form, and he is the host of the new podcast, The Way, which is a part of the Ephesus School Network, of which I am also a part. And he's before that where I knew him and read his writings and engaged with him in the, the wonderful blogosphere, his Rediscover Christianity blog. And of course, above all that, he is an Orthodox Christian priest of the Most High God. How are you doing today, Father Dustin? I'm doing well, uh, Deacon Hanak. Uh, thank you for having me. So. Of course, of course. We were we were already having some great conversations off air, and we're like, all right, we gotta we gotta rush back to get this on air to share it with the good folks at home and not hold back anything. But it's kind of uh, funny. We we could we could start on a on a kind of silly note and then get into the more serious <laughs> stuff. You've begun podcasting now, whereas before you were you were just writing. And I see you've got some handy dandy equipment there that seems to be mirroring my own. Could you tell me about how that transition went from the written word to the audio word? <laughs> yeah. So so the blog, which is at you know dustinlion.org you know, for those who want to check it out. So it started as um, a blog that I, at that time, called Rediscovering Christianity, as you said, although now I've transitioned to calling it The Way to kind of keep everything consistent. Yep, but, right. um The blog started, oh, I don't know, at least, I don't know, three, four or five years ago. I, I, I don't recall how long. It's been a while that I've done it. And... What had happened is I, I, I was in my previous parish in Dubuque, Iowa, and I was looking for ways to kind of both engage the community and, uh, you know, I was writing sermons every week. I thought there's got to be a way instead of just writing them to a small community and then having them disappear is, <laughs> you know, maybe there's a way of kind of recording this or preserving it and, and still engaging a larger community and also allowing people to kind of check out the church without having to walk through the doors like, what is it about? What are they teaching? Who is Father Dustin? You know, these sorts of things. So there are a lot of things kind of going through my mind as I, as I started the blog. And I had become great friends with uh, Gary Neil Hansen, who is, uh, at that time, he was teaching at the uh, University of Dubuque Seminary, which is a Presbyterian and Methodist background. Um, he was teaching there. Uh, his, his focus is church history. And he had written uh, an award-winning book called Kneeling with Giants. And in that book, each chapter, it's about how to, how to pray. And so he looks at historical methods of prayer, and that those are the giants that he talks about, you know, kneeling, of course, referring to prayer. Yeah. And in each chapter, he looks at different ways. He looks at Martin Luther. He looks at uh, Benedictines. He has a chapter on the Jesus prayer, you know, for the Orthodox. And... Um, so he had an interest in orthodoxy, he had come to church services um, at my place a few times, and so we struck up a friendship. And he was talking about the publishing world, because obviously with his best-selling book, he had gotten into the publishing world. But he had said one of the things he had learned is he needed to kind of build an audience or have a way of engaging with people before he went to the publishers. And one way he had done that was through blogging. And so he also has his own website and his own blogs, and he does that regularly. Weekly, he has something that comes out. And so he had encouraged me to also engage through blogging, you know, start engaging the community that way. And so he gave me a lot of tips that helped me set up the website, helped me set up the platform, uh, helped me with uh, how to think through content and those sorts of things. And so that's how I, I got into the blog. And... Um, you know, been doing that. You know, I would I would do sermons. I would do kind of um, sometimes I would be responding to someone on Facebook and think, oh, this would make a great blog post. And so I'd kind yeah. of expand it, organize it a little bit, pop it up on the website. Um, um, so so that's how that got started. And uh, eventually, what happened was Father Mark Bulos, 
uh, who, as we know, through the Ephesus school, um, well, he's, he's the creator of the Ephesus school. Um, and then, you know, the, the Bible as literature podcast, him and, and Richard Benton. I had known Father Mark for years, probably since 2004. Um, so I had converted to Orthodoxy in Minneapolis um, at the University of Minnesota. And Father Mark, uh, along with a lot of the other priests in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, were doing the college ministry on campus, the, what we call the OCF, Orthodox Christian Fellowship. So I'd gotten to know Father Mark um, while I was still an undergrad in college. And Father Mark, um, of course, we had stayed in touch through Facebook and those sorts of things. And it was kind of following my career, so to speak, as, as I became a priest and went on and uh, was aware of the blog. And, and my wife is from the Minneapolis area. So we got back to Minneapolis quite a bit. And uh, we would visit when we were there, we would go and hang out with him at his church at St. Elizabeth. And uh, one time, Father, I, th I think this was last fall, we were in Minneapolis for a clergy lady conference. And so I called up Father Mark and, and Father Paul Tarazi and said, hey, while we're in town, let's go grab something to eat together and catch up. And Father Mark says, you know, you're really consistent with that blog. And he goes, would you consider putting it in podcast form? <laughs> and so I said, well, let me think about the technology and, you know, what that tra transition looks like. And he said, that's fine. And so uh, I, I guess I have six episodes out now, I think. Uh, so I... And then with COVID hitting, I, I had to transition to virtual uh, sorts of things. And so I, I just kept pushing that. And uh, the way, you know, the podcast uh, came about and here we are. Thank thank you so much. It's so, it's so brilliant. You, you brought together so many different worlds. Earlier when you were talking about the sort of consigning of a sermon or a homily to a written word so that it could be shared beyond your local parish, but with all people, it reminds me, you know, if we go to the earliest church, how the Pauline writings were themselves later scripturalized and read for other audiences to this present day allowed in communities that are mostly illiterate. If we go a little further in church history, it reminds me of uh, Holy John Chrysostom, whose sermons, mm -hmm. of course, are written down. And they're some of the, the most uh, volu voluminous of all the works written in the Greek of the time and compare it to a lot of other works, you know, it's just simply preserved more than other works. If you bring it a little bit closer and you look at the Coptic tradition, Pope Shenouda, mm -hmm. who passed away a few years ago, from, from what I know, I don't think he's written a single book and yet I've read a couple of his books, you know, one on fasting and another on comparative theology. And it was only later I found out that it was people writing down his sermons in Arabic, translating them and compiling them in the in the forms of books. So yeah, it's it's very it's very powerful. One of my inspirations is a an entrepreneur named Gary Vaynerchuk, and he always talks about how you can create content in one sphere, be it video, audio, and reading. Uh, or writing, and you can translate it to the other with help. If you need to outsource, you can outsource, but if you could do it on your own, like it looks like you've been able to do it out on your own, doesn't look like you've had to hire a team yet, uh, but maybe <laughs> down the line. Uh, it, it seems like very feasible if you already have content in one sphere to, to transfer it over another sphere. So I, I'm so glad that you adapted and you were, you were able to do that in, in so many ways in recording the liturgy and recording your sermons, your blog posts, and now your, your six episode podcast. Of course, I, I know what you mean when you say the way, but for the sake of our audience, can you tell us how you came up with the title, the way, and what, you know, what relevance that has to Christianity writ large? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the way is originally what Christians were called. Um, so if you go back to the book of Acts, um, they refer to the Jesus movement as the way. And it eventually refers to that Christianity is not just a, a, uh, a set of dogmas or theologies, but a, a way of living your life. And kind of the, the way of talking about that is you're walking the way. You know, you're following God's instruction in that way, and you're making that instruction real through the way you live your life. And so I thought, you know, ultimately that's our calling as Christians or as the church isn't just to come to church and learn or memorize the creed, for example, you know, a bunch of dogma about who God is, you know, uh, in Trinity or Jesus as, as divine and human, all these sorts of things. But it's to put, to put Jesus's teachings or the teachings we find in scripture actually into practice. And so I thought, 
uh, the way was an appropriate title for the podcast. And so that's what that refers to. And in the in the image, if you go, go and look at the advertisement or go to the Ephesus School Network webpage, the image is of a Roman road because the other way you could translate the way is the road, you know, that you walk on a road. Um, and so I, I put an image of a Roman road there as a <laughs> as a way of emphasizing that. Yeah, the, the walking, the walking in the in the way. That's how uh, Enoch, my my namesake, not the son of Cain, but the son of Jared, <laughs> was uh, translated because he was walking on that road or walking along the way. That's so beautifully put. You you raised the issue of dogmatics. Now it's so fascinating. The Orthodox Church, in my opinion, is this this vast ocean, or you could call it a set of several seas with such depths of wisdom to be gathered. And there, there are so many areas of specialization that folks can have. Now, we've already mentioned kind of three categories, right? Liturgics, which, you know, you, you must have, you know, at least a basic competency. And if you're a priest, you have to, you have to do liturgics. You have, um, you know, homiletics in your parish. And then you have like this kind of outreach that you're talking about where you feel, feel your, you're kind of instantiating the the fulfillment of Jesus's teaching that you learn through scripture. You have dogmatics, right? Where people go into apologetics and argue with atheists, argue with Muslims, argue with other branches of, of Christianity. Um, some, someone from, from actually your branch of Christianity is considered a different branch than, than my branch. And they may argue until kingdom come and then be in trouble when kingdom does come. But I'm, I'm interested in how, how did you get to, um, get let, let's let's start off with your first call and then we'll we'll go into to, to scripture right in in Greek the word ecclesia for church has this connotation of gathering but also the call and there's in the Petrine writings this general call for all believers to be a part in the royal priesthood but you've you've entered a more specific kind of New Testament priesthood how how did you feel the call of of priesthood in the in the sense and the functional sense that that you have now and that we're talking about versus kind of the the general call of the priesthood of believers yeah. that's an interesting question um i i i that the, the answer to that question is kind of tied to my my story in conversion to orthodoxy as a whole so uh uh uh, so I grew up in Iowa. I'm like a sixth generation Iowan um, and a ninth generation American, something like that. Uh, my first ancestors came to America in 1690. So, you know, I've had grandfathers fight in the American Revolution, the Civil War, those sorts of things. So I'm about as American as you can get. <laughs> but, an uh, Iowan amongst Iowans and an American yeah, amongst yeah, yeah, Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could be a new Paul of sorts. And <laughs> so, uh, so what happened was... So I grew up United Methodist, and you know I had circuit rider pastors, um, which refers to in the frontier time, um, these pastors would get on horseback and go village to village, and you know so your little your little church in the woods or out in the field or wherever would only see the pastor once in a blue moon, you know when he came wow. to visit. And so I grew up kind of in that tradition uh, of United Methodist and uh, in, in Southeast Iowa. But then when I went to school at the University of Minnesota, as I had mentioned earlier, um, my, my first year at school and college was 9-11. So I, I had wow. just arrived in Minneapolis, you know, the Iowa farm boy, so to speak, now in the big city, two weeks <laughs> into it, 9-11 um, uh, happens. And, and I even remember... Um, I was I was literally so me and my roommate we had a TV and of course you got free cable for the first two weeks because they wanted to kind of sucker you into buying it and so we we had cable and I remember it was early in the morning I was putting on my pants and there was a banging like this huge banging on my dorm room door and I thought who is banging on my door <laughs> I don't know, it wasn't even eight o'clock in the morning yet I thought, who who is banging on my door and it was the guy from down the hall and uh he goes, he goes, open up, open up. You got to turn on the TV. You got to turn on the TV. And I thought, what is going on? So I let him in. We turn on the TV. And of course, you know, the news is up. And, yep. it, you know, the first tower had been hit at that time. Um, and we're kind of watching it. And we're just trying to figure this out. So I thought, well, I still have class. So, um, so I finished dressing, got my bag and went off. And I, it was actually my Greek class, class uh, studying classical Greek. So I- Oh, an undergrad. Yeah, in undergrad. Well, I, I double majored in archaeology 
classical and Eastern archaeology and religious studies. So I was doing a double major. So we're sitting in my in my Greek course, and um, and there's like one person with a cell phone, you know, because cell phones existed, but not many people had them. Yeah. And there's one person with a cell phone, and they got a call as we were waiting for the for the teacher to show up, and they said the second tower had been hit. Oh my god! And, and you know, at that point, we were just kind of like, we have, we have no idea what's going on. And uh, eventually, they end up canceling classes. Went through noon, and then the university canceled classes. And that had been like the first time they had canceled classes in years. Like in living memory, no one had ever remembered classes being canceled. And so that that weekend, I convinced my entire dorm floor to go to church with me. <laughs> so if you can imagine, you know, you know, the, a bunch of new freshman guys coming to the dorm away from home for the first time and someone saying, Hey, I have a good idea. Let's go to church. <laughs> yeah. R rarely would that ever be said yes to, but the, that season of fervor and patriotism, I myself was in middle school at the time. And even some of my peers had cell phones, but I remember being six or something AM in the West coast. And I, I remember watching it happening with just utter shock. And I remember, you know, immediately everyone's got their American flag. So the patriotism was up the, the, the fervor, is up the religiosity at least in an external sense i don't know about an yep. internal sense and and you can talk about that further was up but yeah i recall yeah. i mean even we had he was from trinidad and tobago uh, african descent um and he was hindu and he even came to church with us that sunday wow and so um uh so we went to church and so i said well what church do you guys want to go to because obviously we were of different backgrounds and different denominations. And Minnesota is, for the most part, Lutheran country. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you're organizing it. We'll go wherever you want to go. So I found the Methodist church in Minneapolis, the one closest to campus. And so we went to that Methodist church. And and as I said, I had double been double majoring uh, in archaeology and religious studies because ever since I'd seen, and this is going to sound corny, but ever since I'd seen Indiana Jones in fourth grade, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, whether it was was it whether to be an archaeologist or to become a pastor, because I had gotten really involved in my Methodist church growing up. And yeah. so, I, so I, I was kind of split. So I was double majoring to keep both paths open. I don't yeah. think that's corny, by the way, Father. I think it's okay. very beautiful. <laughs> and as a as an Ethiopian, we're very we're very proud of our alleged holding of uh, what Moses held there, those ten instructions. Oh, we froze. You, okay. Can you hear okay. me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. You're saying I was as saying, Ethiopian, yeah. As an Ethiopian, we're very proud of the Ark of the Covenant that we allegedly mm, have, yes. and yep. that Indiana Jones, I think, popularized in the imaginations of of many English speaking peoples. Yep. Yep. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so we all went to church, and what happened was that the Methodist Church in Minneapolis was very different than the Methodist Church I had grown up in in Iowa, obviously. You know, there's a lot of different dynamics there, uh, you know, more conservative Iowa versus more liberal city sort of things. Mm -hmm. And so as a young person dealing with 9-11, it, it kind of threw me off. I didn't know what to think of this. That And do you mean like a high church, low church type of distinction of liturgical no, versus more evangelical or just liberal conservative? More in, in approaches to theology um, okay. is what I'm thinking. Um, and... And, and, you know, I may be unique. I, I'm very kind of uh, intellectually, theologically oriented, um, even, even as, as a young child. Um, and so so the idea that you can have two, essentially two different theologies within the chain, same church through me. <laughs> I mean, I knew there were different denominations and we weren't all on the same page. But yeah. it really caused me to start thinking if, if Jesus starts a church, an ecclesia, in the first century— or Paul goes around and starts a church because, um, you know, Jesus doesn't do the, you know, Paul does a lot of the footwork. Um, and But he 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 emphasizes this oneness, right? Uh, Jesus, um, in, in John chapter 4, when he's doing his Last Supper sermon, you know, he prays, I pray that you are one as I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. And then Paul, um, as he talks about, you know, the point in Galatians is that we can't have these schisms. We can't have these divisions. We need to be one church, one group of people. And he even emphasized that over and over again. I went to Jerusalem. We talked to them. We agreed Peter would, would handle the Judeans. I'll handle the Gentiles. But we're one church, essentially, even though we may live that out differently, you know, as Jew or Gentile, male, female, slave, free. We may live that out differently, but we're all one. 
and you see this this emphasis on this over and over again. And so I didn't know what to think now that we're not only divided among denominations, but within the same churches divided. And and this past what was it last year or whenever it was, you can see this fracturing even within the United Methodist Church. This fracturing that I saw back in 2001 is now playing out on a global scale within the Methodist Church in a very public way. And so, so this caused me to really start thinking, what is church? Where do I find church? What happened to that church that was started in the first century? And so I kind of gave up on church. I still consider myself a Christian, but I didn't know what that meant. And so obviously I'm, I'm no longer going to become a pastor, right? <laughs> if, I'm a, if I'm a churchless Christian, there, there's no congregation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a sheep without a shepherd, so to speak. Um, and what happened was I, I ended up going on an excavation in Greece. So I spent two summers living in Greece on an excavation. Um, it was a part of my archaeology requirements. And, uh, of course, in Greece, you're stumbling either over the pagan temples or the Byzantine churches, right? That, that, yep. that's, Greek, that's Greek history, um, the two major parts of Greek history. So I came back and I thought, you know, if I'm a religious studies major, because I, I kept doing that, um, if I'm a religious studies major, I should probably figure out what this Orthodox thing is, because it seems like they're a pretty major player in the worldwide stage. Yeah, <laughs> maybe in America, so here. Yeah, yeah, maybe in America we're a small minority, but worldwide, after the Catholics, it's the second largest church. And... Um, 200 right. million plus. Yeah, 300 million, I think, is the is the number that you hear tossed around. What that means, <laughs> you know, practicing, non-practicing, baptized, you know, yeah. we can argue that. But uh, so I ended up, that's where I thought, well, I'll go to the OCF, the local college group, just to learn about it. I had no intention of, con of converting. And so I went to my first OCF and um, uh, Father Timothy Sass, who is the, the Greek priest up in Duluth, Minnesota now, um, but at that time, he was in Minneapolis, um, was there. And this this was the first time I actually talked with an Orthodox priest. I had met them in Greece, but not really talked with them. Um, mm -hmm. because language beyond a greeting. Stuff. Yeah, beyond a greeting. And so he had begged me after the first session, you have to come back. You have to come back. Don't just make this a one-time thing. Please come back. And so I, I promised him, okay, I'll come back. So the next week, uh, my wife's uncle was there leading the OCF. Uh, he's a deacon in the Orthodox Church. And, uh, and so after that session, uh, the gentleman who had become my godfather approached me, and he was getting his PhD in Russian history at that time. He came up and he said, you can't just learn about the Orthodox Church. You know, OCF is great. We learn a lot of different things, but that's not, that's not what it's about. Um, in other words, today I would say he told me, you have to walk the way, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so he says, let me take you to church. I'll come. I'll pick you up. And so he was going, he took me to uh, the the OCA, Orthodox, Orthodox Church in America, the OCA Church, um, the, the cathedral in Northeast Minneapolis. And uh, that's where I was I was looking at everything I was seeing, you know, hearing the chants, watching the liturgy, uh, listening to the priest speak. And the more I got to know that church, because he kept giving me rides, and then uh, the girl that would become my wife was giving me rides as well. And uh, the more I realized what I'm learning about Orthodoxy sounds a lot like what I'm learning about the early church at the secular university, you know, in my religious studies courses. And so, um, so that's what drew me in. And so I, I converted then to orthodoxy before I graduated uh, from college. And, you know, like I said, I met a lot of great priests, including Father Mark at that point, and, um, who, who helped me along the way. And Father Paul Tarazi came and did a lecture um, in Minneapolis. So I, I met Father Paul. Um, I can't remember if that was right before I converted or right after but it was kind of right in that time period. Uh, I met Father Paul Tarazi as well. And um, and then of course I met my wife and we ended up getting married. And I was trying to decide, okay, I've now graduated as undergrad, what's my next step? Do I go to seminary or do I go to graduate school for archeology? span And I, I, I applied to both and got into both. And um, that's when the, my priest at the time, Father Andrew Morby sat me down he goes, well, he goes, Archaeology is a much far harder discipline to get into. Mm -hmm. Go do what you want to do in archaeology. If after that you still want to be a priest, um, we'll get you back into seminary. So I, I, I went at, at, to the University of, of Missouri, uh, Mizzou, and got my master's degree in archaeology. And uh, the further I got into that career, the more I realized there's not a lot of um, potential there. 
mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, you know, uh, the humanities is not being supported like it should be in the universities. And as the, the big name archaeologists are retiring, the universities are getting rid of the positions. And so the, the further and further I got into um, archaeology, the more I realized probably what would happen is I'd come out with a, with a doctorate where I, was, where I would be able to say, do you want fries with that in a bunch of dead languages? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't sure that 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 um, that that future that there really was a future in archaeology at that point. You know, like a lot of people getting doctorates in the humanities, a lot of them graduate and really can't support themselves. And so I, I thought, well, maybe this is God telling me he wants me to go to seminary. Maybe this is God kind of speaking to me and, and saying, okay, you have a great background for biblical studies and stuff. Why don't you go use that at the seminary? And why don't you go use that as a priest? And so I told my wife, I said, I think I want to finish the, the master's degree in archaeology, but then go to seminary. And her first reply was, nope, no way, not being a priest's wife, not doing it. <laughs> So, so I let it drop, and a, and a few months later, she came back to me, and I hadn't said a thing to her, and she essentially said, "You know, if you want to go to seminary, we're young. Now's the time to do it. I don't, I don't want to have to, to be the one to have hold, held you back from something you really want to do in life." And she goes, "We'll go to seminary. I don't know about being a priest, priest wife yet, but we'll go to seminary and see what happens." And so uh, I ended up going to St. Vladimir's in New York City, um, which is which is a, a very academic uh, seminary. The premier, the premier, the premier yeah, one in the exactly, United yeah, um, yeah. Alexander Schmemann taught there. Uh, John Meindorf taught there. Um, George Florovsky taught there. Yeah, uh, Father Paul Tarazzi taught there. Um, so a lot of big names. Um, and so I ended up going to New York City. Uh, my wife realized that priest wives are normal people, just like the rest of us. And so I, I ended up getting ordained, and um, eventually found my way into the Greek Archdiocese, which is where I am now. Um, so I know that's a, a long response to your question, how did you get into the priesthood? But it, it goes from, from that 9-11 experience and kind of really looking at my faith and what it means to follow Christ and kind of going through archaeology and eventually um, finding my way into orthodoxy. So No, I don't think it's too long at all. In fact, I think it's contextual. The, these biographical or we could even say hagiographical elements, I think, paint the, the, the greater context in which even I didn't know you were into archaeology, the idea of uh, and I didn't realize archaeology would be within the humanities. The reason I say that is oftentimes, you know, I studied the humanities, namely philosophy, which normally moves in this in this um, kind of ancient Greek philosophical way from the abstraction to the practice rather than the Hebraic way of moving from the grounded reality or the practice to the theory. But the archaeologist is more like that Hebraic heart that that excavates and digs out the meaning. And so, you know, in, in a sense, you're still an archaeologist. It's just that the landscape that you have chosen to excavate is scripture. And as I mentioned earlier that I think I would love for you to answer now is, you know, you might have been initially attracted by the beauty of, I don't know if it was Church Slavonic or if it was English at that OCA, or you may have been, or a mixture of the two, or it may have been the incense, the vestments, the iconography, the the actual liturgy it, itself. I know the Methodists have uh, a base form of, litur uh, of liturgy, which is at least far more elaborate than other lower church evangelical communities. And um, frankly, there's so many areas, dogmatics that we mentioned earlier. H how did you feel that that call from scripture itself and say, okay, I'm going to seminary, but there are a million things you could have studied at St. Vladimir's. I know because I've, I've purchased many books from there and I've had friends who've gone there as well. I've had other friends who try to goad me into going. I still don't have any formal seminary or theological college, but I even have a, a friend who's a dean of a different university in my own communion who uh, who's, uh, loves to badger me on different occasions as well to try to <laughs> goad me into get that master's. But you know, I joke around with Father Mark and with Dr. Richard that the Ephesus School Network and OCAPS or the Orthodox Center of the Advancement of Biblical Studies has been my informal seminary over the past six years when I've been studying you know, the digital content that, that they have been publishing. So yeah, how, how did you choose scripture within that? And has, that, has, has it changed from you know, your time of being 
like you described, an Iowan Methodist versus encountering Minnesota Methodism versus being, you know, churchless or a sheep without a shepherd, as you described it, and then moving on to seminary until, you know, years later now where you've gotten in the groove of being a priest. Yeah. I mean, so the joke at seminary is that um, there were two approaches. You know, there were, at the time, Father Paul Tarazi was still teaching at the seminary. Um, so there was the, the, the Father Paul Tarazi approach to orthodoxy, and then there was kind of more the patristic theological schmemen, let's say, approach to, to orthodoxy. And, you know, at that time, so uh, my patristic professor, um, you know, was Father John Bear. Um, he, he just left St. Vlad's. Yeah, um, to England. To England or Scotland. Yeah, he's teaching in Scotland yeah. now this summer. But um, he was teaching there at that time. And I think what's interesting is some people saw a, a complete split as if there were two kind of two different worlds or two different approaches. And as I thought about it myself, I think they're saying the same thing, but in different ways. Um, like and that. what was what I what I feel really privileged or blessed to have gone through is at that time they were switching what they called the new curriculum. Of course, it's no longer the new curriculum, and I don't know what it looks like today. You know, this was uh, I graduated in 2011, so that was a number of years ago. But at that time, instead of learning like theology or dogmatics or something like that. Um, what we did for uh, the church fathers or patristics is we actually, and this is how Father John Bear would lecture. So Tarazi would lecture, he, he would pick up the Bible, he had his Bible, and he would lecture straight from the Bible, right? No surprise, much like, you know, the Bible's literature podcast, they they start reading through the Bible and they start lecturing and, and, and do it. Uh, Father John Bear did that with the patristic texts. And so we would pick up St. Athanasius or St. Irenaeus or um, Origen or, you know, any of these uh, big church fathers. And we would read through the entire text. And in other words, what, what Father John was trying to do is give us the entire context uh, of what was being argued and then say, okay, what is this church father really saying and why is he saying it and what is he responding to? Um, and when you do it that way, um, sometimes... It's very interesting because the context will enlighten the text in a way that's different than if you just pick up and say, okay, I want to study about the Holy Spirit. This Here's mm -hmm. one paragraph about the Holy Spirit from this father. Here's one paragraph about the Holy Spirit from this other father. And sometimes the way it's presented is not what that father meant or it, yes, you know, there's a in, in other words, I think to give people context, the way in which I think education has been modernized in the high school level as well is rather than daring to sift through the actual text of Shakespeare, you'll see what somebody in 2020 uh, or 2020 has to say about a certain systematic theme or topic within the Shakespeare books. Yep. And, and so you're saying that it's more eisegesis than exegesis. It's somebody throwing their own interpretations, which has yep. a danger of, of obfuscating that, that original. Exactly. So exactly. the similarity you're drawing between what Father Paul Nadim Tarazi's emphasis on scripture was and Father John Bear's emphasis on the patristics was they're dealing with the actual authors and the text themselves. And they're assuming that, you know, postmodernism is not true and there aren't infinite meanings but there might be a few meanings within there and, and trying to glean them. Yep, exactly. Well, and so, and the other thing that happens is, is when you, when you study, so one, when you look at scripture and actually read through an entire argument, like you read through, like we're doing um, in the, in the Galatians Bible study, um, by the end of the Bible study, we'll have read through the entire argument of Paul in Galatians, right? So we can, we, we have, we have the complete context. We see what he's actually saying. We're not trying to isolate verses. And, and I, and this is something I criticized in one of my podcasts a few weeks ago, is I said, so oftentimes we think of orthodoxy or we think of Christianity or religion as these sort of theological dogmas, who God is, you know, in his essence or his nature, his person. Yes. Um, but yet then we read through the Bible and we see that St. Paul or the evangelists aren't really concerned with God's essence, right? They're revealed about how God reveals himself through his instruction, which we're called to you know, as I said, to walk, to follow. Um, and so it's kind of almost two different worlds in that way. And in many ways, what the church fathers are doing and what you realize when they're reading through, when you read through the, the entire argument of a church father is um, 
they aren't just making abstract, you know, God's Trinity, these sorts of things, but they're working through saying, okay, if we see God the Father perfectly in Christ's sacrifice, what does this mean? Well, it must mean, you know, as Paul concludes, he's the son of God, you know, and from this flows ideas of the Trinity and stuff, but there's a context, a connection with scripture and what they're seeing in that. And so it kind of all comes together in that sense. Um, and when you're trained this way is I can, so now when I read like modern Orthodox theologians, for example, um, I can, it's very clear whether they have a good sense of the full argument of a church father or of scripture or whether they're kind of repeating formulas. And so uh, there, there was a book, I won't say who it was because it's a very famous 20th century Orthodox theologian and I, I know people like him, so I don't want to, I don't want to diss him. Oh, you revealed his gender. <laughs> well, I, I mean, most, most of the famous ones are male, uh, uh, although we're getting some more female ones, which I think is good, more female voices. But um, he was, the this, this theologian was talking about kind of the ascetic life, and mm -hmm. he wanted to connect it into the kind of life of the Trinity. And as I was reading through his description of the Trinity, and he goes into a lot of detail and, and tries to connect it to the, the ascetic life, it became very painfully obvious to me. He really had no sense of why, you know, why we say God is Trinity or why uh, you know, why there's this dis distinction in Christ between, you know, the divine nature and the human nature. And it, it was it was almost as if all he could do is repeat, repeat formulas and had no understanding of them. Um, and so I I got fed up and just put the book down and said, <laughs> I'll move on to the next book I want to read. But that, uh, that's all right. Yeah. But the, the other thing that's that's really interesting and and uh and one way in which the church fathers can uh, illuminate the meaning of scripture, um, and, and I know uh, Father Paul comes very comes down very hard in some of the church, some of the church fathers, uh, you know, as being philosophically influenced and those sorts of things. And in some cases, he's right. But there was a uh, I was reading a book, and um, it was a book uh, on N.T. Wright and his view of the the continuing exile, as he calls it. Mm -hmm. And I was reading this book, and at the bottom there was a footnote. And the footnote referred to an Oxford thesis. And they were talking about the law and how the law fit into, you know, Paul's understanding of the continuing exile and all these sorts of things. And I, I was really interested in, in this interpretation of the law and what the law meant. And I thought, I'm going to look up this Oxford thesis and see if I can find it and read it because it's going to elaborate this one point in the book much more. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it and come to find out it was an unpublished Oxford thesis because the, the gentleman had just graduated. So through wow. the magic of Facebook, I, I found the, the author of the thesis. Wow. <laughs> He's actually living now in California, teaching at a Catholic school. And um, so I, I messaged him on Facebook and I said, by the way, did you know that your work is referenced in a footnote here? And I said, is there any way that that I could get a hold of your thesis to read it. And he very quickly got back to me and emailed me a PDF of his entire thesis. Amazing. And, um, and I think it's actually in the process of being published. It might be published now, um, but he sent me an entire thesis. And what the thesis was is he was looking at what the church fathers meant by the law when they're, when they're talking about Paul and the law. And one thing that became very clear is that when they refer to the law, and the, especially the law in the negative sense, kind of, you know, they're actually referring to what, what's called the observances of the law or, or the works of the law. They're talking specifically about keeping kosher, keeping the purity laws, circumcision, keeping Sabbath, you know, these sorts of outward signs. And the church fathers, um, the early church fathers that this, this gentleman looked at, you know, painstakingly went through all the different texts of the early church fathers to show this is exactly what they mean and how they read Paul. So when when Paul on one hand says you know he well so when when Paul's talking about the law he's not just taking the entire law as a whole you know the five books of Moses and throwing it out the window what no, he's doing no. is he's talking about a very specific um, definition of the law you know these outward practices of the law not the law as following the instruction or the good works or these sorts of things um, which has been a problem for the Protestants you know they've kind of seen Paul as as anti law. Therefore, good works and all of that has nothing to do with your salvation. But what Paul's referring to is something much more specific. 
And um, and so today you see this like in the work of David Bentley Hart. Um, if you read his New Testament and you go to his postscript, I think he calls it scientific postscript or something like that. And he talks about, you know, he, he doesn't just translate law as law in Paul. He goes observances of the law is how he translates it to indicate, you know, Paul's not referring to the entirety of the five books of Moses, but to specific ways of, of living out that law. So, yeah, and that's so funny because, you know, we, we talked about it, I think, during this year's Jubilee celebration of Father Paul. But this this same individual you just referenced is such a great scholar. And on the one hand is kind of repopularizing this, this ancient false teaching uh, mm -hmm. that all shall be saved, right? Apocastasis, giving it a fancy Greek name too. Uh, uh, at the same time, has one of the most beautiful translations of the New Testament I've ever seen. I have I have it on audiobook. I don't have the paperback of that one, but I also have N.T. Wright's kind of mm -hmm. uh, New Kingdom translation yep. as well. And those yep. are two opposite ends of the spectrum. The uh, what I love is both of them have agreed to eschew committees, which I have written elsewhere on my former blogs at Number One Tools of the Devil of the Diablos, <laughs> and uh, you know they they both taken on individual which are gargantuan and tremendous translations. N.T. Wright meant to do it in as modern, contemporary, and what is called thought for thought or dynamic fashion as possible, rendering mm -hmm. the Greek understandable. And then David Bentley Hart wanted to render it maybe as opaque and yet uh, kind of beautiful in a, in a in a stylish sense, while while he does think the Greek itself, I've heard him say, is 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 ugly in a sense compared to other Greek writings of the time. I, I wonder if you're if you are recommending, let's say you have a recommendation for the masses and for the elites, or if your recommendation is the same for everyone who's watching, what type of Bible translation? Pre let's pretend for a moment <laughs> they don't know biblical Greek like you do. What type of Bible translations would you recommend for them? Well, um, you know, like like you had said um, in the Galatians Bible study, uh, a multiple trip reading multiple translations is probably your, your best bet. Um, so typically, if someone's looking for like, it, it depends on what they want to do or how much money they have to spend. You know, if someone's looking for a one volume uh, translation of the entire Bible um, that's readable and, you know, something that they just want to kind of sit down and read and get the the, the full sense of it, um, I would probably recommend, recommend either uh, kind of the Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version, um, that that um, those are, I think are very well done, uh, very accessible in a modern English, very understandable in that sense. Um, so, and, and that's that's what we used at seminary. That's what I used as an undergrad in my religious studies was that New Revised Standard Version. Um, um, so, so that would be like if, if I had to recommend one, that one because it's the full full text. Old Testament, New Testament, um, in one volume. Deutero canon. Ex yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you can get the apocrypha and all of that as well. Um, in you know, is that translation? Um, if you if you want to kind of branch out um, for the Old Testament, I'd also recommend Robert Alter's Old Testament. Um, although that's quite expensive. Um, you know, it, it's I I I think my you know, and it's very thick because he has commentary that's running in the bottom. But the commentary is very nice because he explains the meaning of the Hebrew. You know, he doesn't dwell too much on theology or those sorts of things, but rather on, on translation sorts of issues. But it's very nice because like David Bentley Hart, he kind of did a more wooden translation or stuck closer to the, the, the original language. So you can see when there's plays on words a lot easier um, in Robert Alter. So for the Old Testament, Robert Alter would be another option for the New Testament. Um, other than the one I recommended would be uh, David Bentley Hart's New Testament, published by Yale, or uh, N.T. Wright's is another one that I really like. Um, so those would be, so the Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, Robert Alter, uh, uh, N.T. Wright, and then uh, David Bentley Hart would be the, the translations that I recommend. So thank you for those recommendations. What's funny is that David Bentley Hart and N.T. Wright have come at each other you know, they have, have uh, gotten in, in some heated debates and maybe that's because they're both individuals with radically different approaches. But it seems you also, like me, would would recommend uh, both what you, you know, what you refer to as the wooden translation, right? That, mm -hmm. that kind of renders the original idioms as close as is possible. Of course, it's going to it's going to fail, you know, 
there's one uh, saying, my, my sister uh, studied linguistics for a time, and one of the first phrases they taught her was translation tra uh, traitor. I think it was in either in Italian or in Latin, and they said basically anyone who translates is, is treachery, <laughs> uh, is treacherous. And so I, I, I um, you, you don't, you don't find there to be any weight to their kind of arguments back and forth about what's better, a wooden translation or a more contemporary understandable. Because the kind of critique of the wooden one is that, and this is why I said elites and masses, is that some people are turned off by having to run to the dictionary. I, I find myself to be uh, one of the most voracious readers in, in several different groups that I'm in. And every time David Bentley Hart writes, you know, I find myself running to a dictionary. I can only imagine <laughs> it's, you know, a worse case for others. So, so, you know, the, the worry is being intimidated perhaps by the, the, the high level of the, of the writing. And then the, of course, the danger on the other side and the critique of the anti right translation is that when it's too modern, it goes back to what you and I were saying about people's interpretations of a text rather than the text itself. Yeah. So, um, so I, I guess maybe this is, I'm going to pull out my, my priest hat and say, uh, the answer is pastoral. So it, it, which one, you know, if they're looking between Dave Bentley Hart or N.T. Wright, you know, if they want to go those routes, which one? Um, uh, my answer is it, it depends on what you're wanting to do. Um, so uh, the, the wooden translation of David Bentley Hart probably is harder to understand, not just because he uses some big words. Um, he's famous for that. Um, but it's harder to understand because he translates the Greek woodenly in the way that and as he, as we mentioned, or you mentioned earlier, it, the New Testament is bad Greek. It's not, you know, it, it's with with a few exceptions. You can tell it's Greek is maybe a second language um, uh, in it. And so, in some cases, there are places where verbs and subjects don't match, or they change the tense in the middle of a sentence. They aren't consistent. You know, things someone who's speaking Greek as a second language would do. You know, if you hear an immigrant speaking English, you know, as a second language, you can tell, you know, they'll, they'll mess up and that's fine. You know, that, that's how you learn a language. But what David Bentley Hart has done is he says, well, if I'm going to translate what the Greek is saying, he'll translate the English poorly as well. So if they switch tenses in the Greek, he'll switch tenses in the English. Whereas, uh, you know, say like the New Revised Standard Version or most translations will keep it consistent. They'll render in, into good English. Um, for the sake of the reader, but Hart isn't interested in that. So it it, <laughs> it it does make the text harder, although there are things that come through in his translation that I think are, that, you know, if you're trying to understand the argument, there are some things, um, for example, like his translation of the law as observances of the law. It, it, I think this is an important part for in Paul, for example. And so there are things that come through that are very important in following the text, but it does make it more difficult. Um, but if someone's willing to tackle that and, you know, become a better student and, and, and a learner, then I, I say go for it. If, however, someone is saying, you know, I'm new to the Bible, I'm new to kind of the overall arguments or, or the, the Bible's a text, I just want to be able to sit down and, and read through without, without interruption, so to speak. I don't want to have to pick up a dictionary. I want to be able to quickly and easily understand and, and read through it. Then I would say go N.T. Wright's way. Um, N.T. Wright has translated in such a way that it's very readable and it's very understandable, and he makes the concepts um, and ideas uh, very approachable. And so if, if, you're wanting, if you want to come at it as a serious student and say, you know, right now I'm just trying to get my head around it and I really want to grasp everything, then go N.T. Wright. Uh, and, and I'm a huge fan of N.T. Wright and his work. And, um, and you can definitely see in, in cases where you can you can see it, how he's reading the text, you know, because of his translation, you know, the way he he translates, obviously, and even calling it the kingdom, you know, testament, uh, you know, that phrase. But it, it makes clear if he's reading the text this way, you can see it all in his theology, you know, his understanding of what's happening. And I think he he's right on the button um, in many cases with his idea of the continuing exile, God's presence not being in the temple, um, and 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 the way he places Christianity within a first century. He calls it the perfect storm, uh, a Jewish, Greek, and Roman world all coming together. Um, he, his theology does that very well and, and gives you a good sense of context. And I think that that's allowed him to translate the New Testament in such a way that it's very approachable.
So again, so pastorally, which translation an individual wants to do really depends on where you're at and what what you're hoping to accomplish by reading the New Testament or um, where you where you're heading. So that's well well put, Father, and and I agree. I I use and I have recommended his translations as as well as David Bentley Hart's. And what strikes me about you know the N.T. Wright translation, like you said, kingdom. Sometimes he says King Jesus instead of Christ to Jesus, or sometimes yep. he'll say Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ. And you know there are other points. I remember years ago seeing James White, you know, one of these head apologetic arguers on the Calvinist or reform side used to get on N.T. Wright about this idea of justification in Protestant Christian circles. And, you know, if you look at his New Testament translation, where you might otherwise see the word justification, and this is similar to how we've seen Father Mark Bulos interpret the text as well, he writes declared righteous. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's one of those many sticking points, as you said, that that kind of expresses the theology within within the text itself, and and shows how how he's guiding that. And it's interesting with um, with a Malankara priest, with an Indian Orthodox priest. One time, we made a short list of something like five to seven very interesting Anglican people, including N.T. Wright, including C.S. Lewis, including Sebastian Brock, the Syriac mm. scholar, yep. in, including Richard Pankhurst, who ultimately converted to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. He was an, an English historian mm. who, who have such interesting takes because like you said, Methodism, which comes from the Church of England, you know, eventually, if you go yep. back in the past, it kind of allows a plurality of theologies so that some of the theology itself is orthodox, whereas, you know, some of it is is very heterodox. And yet, you know, it's in the <laughs> it's in the same structure. And he he strikes me as as one of the the greats there that that, that was beautiful. And then. I would love for you to to give us a pitch because you've been working with these, as you've said, since the undergraduate. For those who want to turn to the next level, do you have any advice for them about approaching biblical Greek? <laughs> yeah, so I would say, you know, for those who want to learn Greek, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there for biblical Greek, you know, because all sorts of seminaries are using it. Um, that one, consider how you learn best. Um, you know, different people learn different ways. You know, if you're a very visual learner, um, you can buy the basics of biblical Greek, for example, like lecture series on Amazon, you know, that goes along with, with texts, you know, so you can actually have a classroom experience in that sense. And I, I assume there's probably free videos on YouTube. So if you want, if you, if you like to learn that way, um, otherwise, if, if you're good at kind of reading through a, a textbook, um, you can kind of get the basic sense that way. But what I would recommend is don't get caught up in, at, at first, at having to memorize all the different parts of Greek grammar. You know, uh, in fact, I, I had one person, the way he teaches languages, um, this was a professor at uh, Wartburg Seminary. It's a Lutheran seminary that I got to know in my previous parish. Um, uh, he would teach biblical Hebrew. And he goes, he told me, he, he was teaching me some Hebrew. And he goes, just read the entire textbook. <laughs> Just sit down and, and read the textbook like you would any other book. And he goes, kind of make note of um, how the grammar is working, but don't worry about memorizing all the endings, all those sorts of things. Just get a general sense of how the language works. Um, and then, then you can go back and you can say, okay, in general, I need to learn present, past, future, you know, these sorts of things and learn kind of the basics. And then the next thing he said, and I think I would recommend this, is actually start digging into the text. Um, so if, if you're learning Greek, you know, an easy text to learn would say like Mark may be a good place to start because Mark is fairly easy Greek. Start with the Gospels. Um, yeah, start with the Gospels. Uh, don't jump into Paul. Paul is much more complex because he's doing more theology, so to speak. Um, it's not story. The story, you know, like following the story of Jesus or the parables is much easier. But kind of go through and... Um, you can also buy books. Um, Bruce Metzger, who is a famous... Uh, Greek scholar. Um, I don't, and he was part of the New Revised Standard Version Translation Committee. I think he was the major force behind that. So he's published books that have word lists where the Greek words are listed by frequency. So, you know, on the first page, it has the words that are most used in the New Testament. It has a list, you know, then like the 500 most used words, and you can memorize that list. And then the 250 most used words, and you can memorize that list. And so by the time at the back of the book, it has like maybe the words used 20 times, you know, in the New Testament. 
but you don't have to worry about those. Um, so you can, if you want to start learning vocabulary and you're good at memorizing, you can start with lists that are like that, you know, and learn the most frequently used words first. And what I would recommend is when you dig into the test the text, get what they call a reader's Bible. So this is not an interlinear, but what the reader's Bible is, is it presents the Greek text, and you can get them from Hebrew too for the Old Testament, is it presents the Greek text text completely. And then at the bottom in footnotes, it'll list, um, it depends on which one, you can get them from different publishers. Um, what the publishers will do is at the bottom is they'll list the more infrequently used words that are used in that text. Uh, and then of course, then there's usually an appendix at the back that lists the frequent, you know, uh, frequently used ones. Um, so what you can do is you can just start reading, and then when you come across a word you don't know or you don't recognize the declension, for example, um, instead of having to go to a dictionary and kind of spend some time, you can quickly go to the bottom of the page and say, oh, that's this word, and then keep reading. So what it does or what the goal of it is to allow someone to, to kind of get in, actually get into the text and get used to and comfortable to reading through and not getting frustrated by coming across words they may not know. Um, so I would recommend, you know, get a basic sense of the language through a textbook or online lectures or something like that. Then kind of start building your vocabulary with, with the most used words in the New Testament and then move to a reader's New Testament. Um, or if you're doing Hebrew, uh, a, a Hebrew uh, reader, um, and then eventually what you'll find is, is the more you read, the more you start recognizing words the less you have to look at the bottom because you'll see see them pop up more and more. You'll get used to it. The next thing you know, you'll be able to sit down and just kind of generally read through a Greek or a Hebrew text uh, without without many problems. And what's nice, unlike an interlinear, you're not seeing the translation right underneath. So you're, it actually kind of forces you as you're reading, you kind of automatically say, okay, I'm going to have to remember that. So less I don't cheating. Look at the bottom. Yeah. So yeah, less cheating. Um so that's what I would recommend if you want to dig into the original texts. It's it's beautiful and encouraging. You know, right now all I have is a random assortment of Greek words in my head, like <laughs> ecclesia, paradosis, parathiki, diakonos, apostolos, doulos, all these things that I've mostly heard uh, being taught through the Ephesus School Network and through, through yep. OCABs that I've heard so many times that I've uh, begun walking in the way through my hearing of them, <laughs> but I have not committed the time to, to put the Greek, but I think, I think after a few more years, I'm going to, I'm going to have to get into the Greek as well. The, the Hebrew, I finally, after six years of, of hearing this call, <laughs> picked it up and I do not, I have nowhere near the vocabulary or the, um, the grammar down yet. What I'm aided by is that I'm a native speaker. I'm Harak. And in my adult life, I picked up Gus, which is our, our church language. And so there are so many cognates being a Semitic family yep. that, you yep. know, I, I, I'm, I'm aided by that in, in knowing a whole amount of words in terms of just recognizing how the, the root plays differently. But then I've I picked up a few and I really like that approach that you said, like I went through a book in probably about five or six weeks, just spending about 15, 30 minutes a day. And then, like you said, I spent some time just, just reading the text and I've, I've committed a few verses to, to memory that, you know, that have been relevant to me and that I've liked to. So that that's good. And I hope somebody is going to be doing that. Now, I really want us to, to replug before we close here, the way podcast again. So can you tell us, they can go to ephesusschool.org to find it, but can you yep. tell us the specific website and I'll, I'll throw it up in our, our YouTube as well for the way podcast, as well as Dustin lion.com, a lion with a uh, lion with L Y O N. Yeah. Dustin lion, um, L Y O N, um, dot org. No, dot org. Sorry. It's dot org. Um, and then, so in, in the podcast go up there also, but the, Perfect. the the website for the podcast is thewaypodcast.transistor.fm, um, or they could just go to the Ephesus School, is it ephesusschool.org or .com? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, they could go to the Ephesus School and find it there. And then you and can also it, find it, you know, I've got it linked to Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, those sorts of things. But, yeah. um, but what I'm doing is, you know, I, I talked about at the very beginning, kind of double dipping and in, in using content in different areas. Yes. So, um, what I'm doing right now is kind of a series on on kind of if you're new to the Bible and have no idea where to start or, or what's going on, is I'm doing kind of some overarching themes right now. And the idea is, is I've had a lot of parishioners say, you know, Father, we do want to start reading the Bible, 
and we start, but then we get to the long list of names and we <laughs> and give, give up, up. Yeah. Or, or we get to the, all those laws and we just give up. <laughs> and so, um, so, uh, so if you go to the web, my website, you can see kind of a, a schedule cause I put the schedule on there, um, uh, kind of where I'm going, but I'm using father Paul Tarazi, some of his major themes. I'm going to use some NT right themes. Um, and this, the podcast that'll come out this week, uh, um, I don't know when you're going to post this. Um, so this week, uh, at this time, would be the 14th. So yeah, when the next okay. podcast it should out, go out today. Okay. All right. So this week on Friday, um, this one is my attempt to to give the entire story, the entire Bible in in one podcast. So Amazing. I go from Genesis to Evala- Revelation, and kind of say, okay, here's the overarching big picture of the story. And here's how it all fits together. So if you're brand new to the Bible and you have no idea what these different books are, what the what what the the major point is, here's my attempt to kind of walk you through the entire thing so that you can kind of have a basic understanding, a basic footing um, for approaching Scripture. So if you pick up and you start reading about King David, you have a sense of where he fits in the entire story. Or if you're reading about Jesus, you have a, a general sense of how he fits into what came before in the Old Testament. So I so I, I've got it written. I haven't recorded it yet, but I've gotten it all written out. And um, so I hope it's useful to people. And then in the following weeks, what I'm going to do is then kind of do kind of some, what are some of the major themes that reoccur over and over and over again in scripture? And I'm going to, you know, I did Father Paul Tarazi's shepherdism. You know, I'm going to go through like the Syrian desert, um, N.T. Wright's continuing exile. You know, some of these major themes that appear over and over and over again, I'm going to talk about them. So my hope is, and I'll keep this up on my website, is that for people who are new to the Bible can go to my website and will be able to kind of look at this page and listen to a few of these podcasts to get a really good basic understanding of Scripture so that they can start reading the individual stories and getting something out of them. So that's my project with the podcast in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so we'll see where that goes. And then after that, um, I'll probably start digging into individual books or or uh, you know something like that. Um, but at least I have... Or when parishioners come to me, I have something to direct them to and say, or for Bible studies, I have something that I can use or content that I can use in that way. So um, so that's well, where I'm I, going right it's, now. It's, it's very great. And in fact, I want to give you encouragement and uh, more more exhortation so we could keep going. I've already been forwarding it, of course, to my parishioners. I'm, I'm not a priest, but I am a deacon. And so I have a flock that that I guide through the word of God. And some of them have already given me positive feedback about this new way podcast. <laughs> and so you can know that your word has already reached the ends of the earth to the Ethiopians oh, as well. well. Thank you. So, well, God bless um, the efforts. You know, it's not me, you know, it's just, um, I, I, I'm called just to repeat, uh, you know, uh, the, that good news that that's given to us. And um, so, I, and I pray that that people find it fruitful. Amen. Amen. And as you said, one of your earlier friends um, began with a blog for a number of years to build a presence. And then there was something he launched. I had a friend like that too. He used actually Instagram as his platform and he used humor. He had a book called Comfortable Christianity and he came from the, the Protestant world originally. But what was interesting is he would get a lot of critiques whenever he would share uh, a Catholic meme or an Orthodox meme. And the kind of virulent reactions that he got from other people made him more open to orthodoxy and <laughs> Catholicism because he said, you know what, I think I'm a I'm a little bit more ecumenical and a little bit more, a little bit less narrow. And I think that that humor and this kind of ecumenism is a natural result of focusing on on scripture to the to the depth that you do. And we'll also be waiting once your presence grows more and more for I'm sure some future books of your own. <laughs> yeah, I, that's that's one thing I haven't done yet is I is I haven't written a book, but uh, maybe someday we'll see. We have we have hope. We have hope. Thank you so much, <laughs> Father Dustin. Yes, thanks for having me. So.